Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the Compasa. In today's episode, I would like to go through the Golden Crescent drug trade and some of the key players that have been involved as well as uh, the war in Afghanistan. We're going to touch upon that. So bear with me and uh, hopefully you will enjoy this episode. Please hit the subscribe button, hit the like button and hit the notification bell so you won't miss any videos. There are a host of reasons why the United States went into Afghanistan. First, I want to talk about the official explanation from the United States government. And I'm quoting here from the United States government website. The United States went to Afghanistan in 2001 to wage a necessary war of self-defense. On September 11, 2001, Al-Qaeda terrorists attacked our country. They were able to plan and execute such a horrific attack because their Taliban hosts had given them safe haven in Afghanistan. Worth noting uh, that the Taliban offered to hand over bin Laden to the United States if they could present evidence of his involvement in the 9-11 attacks and stop the aerial bombardment uh, campaign against Afghanistan. However, the Bush administration rejected the offer from the Taliban. Newly released court filing, the Donald C. Conestero declarations shows that at least two of the 9-11 hijackers were knowingly or unknowingly recruited into a CIA Saudi intelligence operation that may have gone wrong. You can read more about the bombshell report on the gray zone. The more plausible reason to why the United States actually went into Afghanistan was probably the UNOCAL uh, gas pipeline. In uh, Peter Dale Scott's book, The American War Machine, uh, he actually uh, elaborates this a lot, and I'm going to read from it, and it says it goes like this. John Maresca, UNOCAL executive, testified in 1998 to the House Committee on International Relations on a proposed gas pipeline, sent gas, from Turkmenistan through Afghanistan to the coast of Pakistan. A second oil pipeline through Afghanistan was also contemplated uh, by UNOCAL which brought a Taliban delegation to America for training and lobbying purposes. For UNOCAL to have advanced funds for the Taliban conquest in Kabul, as was alleged by the French observer Olivier Roy, uh, would have been in violation of U.S. law, but the UNOCAL vice president in charge of the pipeline was quoted as saying that his company had provided non-cash bonus payments to members of the regime in return for their cooperation. Right after 9-11, a former Pakistani diplomat, Niaz Malik, told the BBC that the George W. Bush administration delivered threats to the Taliban before 9-11 in support of UNOCAL's desire to build oil and gas pipelines through the country from Turkmenistan to Pakistan. As Chalmers Johnson has commented, support for his enterprise, the dual oil and gas pipelines, appears to have been a major consideration in the Bush administration's decision to attack Afghanistan on October 7, 2001. Some have also speculated that the United States is in Afghanistan due to, due to uh, precious metals. In fact, it is said that Soviet researchers actually found precious metals in Afghanistan, and the U.S. and the United States have also found precious metals, and they claim that it's an upwards of a trillion dollars. However, some people are saying that this number is not true, that the real value is, has not even been estimated yet, so we don't actually know the amount um, of, the, uh, of the worth of precious metals in Afghanistan. Uh, however, the Afghan economy is definitely in need of uh, new investments, uh, due to sanctions on the Taliban government in Afghanistan, that is to say, by the United States, and the fact that they're withholding their uh, dollar, uh, dollar reserves on, uh, that is estimated as, let's see here, uh, the United States has freezed $9.5 billion in currency reserves, and the IMF has uh, cut off a $500 million loan. Uh, and the, the, this money, uh, the, the Afghan government desperately needs to rebuild the country uh, and to get it back on its feet. China sees huge potential uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, they see huge potentials in these metals. Uh, however, due to security issues, 
uh, extracting them is very hard at the moment. The United States can uh, essentially veto any, uh, uh, any attempt by China and Russia to ease the sanctions on the Taliban government. Many analysts have compared Afghanistan with Laos uh, because Afghanistan and Laos have a multi-tribal and multi-ethnic society. And Afghanistan has been called a mandala, uh, similar to Laos, a state that is not sovereign and unified, but combines different ethnicities, tribes, legal systems, and religions or sects, that is to say, in this case, Shia and Sunni. Since the outset of the Durrani Afghan kingdom in the 18th century, Afghanistan was a state ravaged and torn by foreign interests. Even though Afghanistan wasn't a colony, the rulers in the country were either supported or ousted by Britain uh, and Russia. Uh, the latter countries were competing for influence in an area they agreed to recognize as a glacis or neutral area between them. In the Afghan Durrani Kingdom, a loose coalition of tribal leaders maintained the social stability via tolerance and circumspection. This was the opposite of central power. One of the consequences, or rather symptoms, of this dispersion of power was the inability to build railways inside Afghanistan, one of the major aspects of nation building in neighboring countries. The British, fearing Russian influence in Afghanistan, often interfered with this equilib equilibrium of tolerance. This was the case with the British foray of 1839 in which their 12,000 man army was annihilated except for one doctor. The British claimed to be supporting the claim of one Durrani family member, Shoja Shah, an Anglophile whom they brought back from exile in India. With the disastrous British retreat in 1842, Shoja Shah was assassinated. The social fabric of Afghanistan uh, with its tr complex tribal network was disrupted by such interventions, uh, especially after World War II, uh, the Cold War widened the gap between Kabul and the countryside. Afghan cities moved toward a more Western urban culture as successive generations of bureaucrats were trained elsewhere, many of them in Moscow. They thus became progressively more alienated from the Afghan ruler areas, which they were trained to regard as reactionary, uncivilized, and outdated. Meanwhile, especially after 1980, moderate Sufi leaders in the countryside were progressively displaced in favor of radical jihadists thanks to massive funding from agents of the Pakistani Inter-Services Intelligence ISI, dispersing funds that came in fact from Saudi Arabia and the United States. So, who were the people the United States got in bed with in 1979? Well, they were drug runners. So, in 1980, White House drug advisor David Musto told the White House Strategy Council on Drug Abuse that we were going into Afghanistan to support the opium growers. Shouldn't we try to avoid what we have done in Laos? Denied access by the CIA to data to which he was legally entitled, Musto took his concern public in May 1980, noting in a New York Times Abed that the Golden Crescent heroin trade was already and for the first time causing a medical crisis in New York and he warned uh, presciently this crisis is bound to worsen. The CIA in conjunction with its creation the Iranian intelligence agency Savak was initially trying to increase right-wing pressure on the regime of Afghan President Mohammad Daoud Khan, whose objectionable policy was to maintain good relations with the Islamist agents arrived from Iran with bulging bankrolls trying to mobilize a purge of left-wing officers in the army and a clampdown on their party, the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan. In a coup that was partially defensive, left-wing officers overthrew and killed Daoud. They installed in its place a left-wing government so extreme and unpopular that by 1980 the Soviets, as Brzezinski had predicted, uh, intervened to install a more moderate faction. By May 1979, the CIA was in touch with Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, 
the Mujahideen warlord with perhaps the smallest following inside Afghanistan and also the leading Mujahideen drug trafficker. Hikmatyar, known for throwing acid in women's faces for not wearing burqas, was the choice not of the Afghan resistance but of the ISI, perhaps because he was the only Afghan leader to accept the British-drawn Durand line as the Afghani-Pakistani boundary. The ISI gave most of the US funds it dispersed to two marginal fundamentalist groups, one led by Gulbidin Hikmatyar and another by Abdul Razul Sayyaf. They knew they had control over these groups precisely because they lacked the popular support among the Afghan population and other groups. This goes against the narrative that the United States supported a popular Afghan liberation movement. The more popular resistance groups were opposed to the Salafist factions because they wanted a centralized Islamic state and the Salafists considered the tribal structure of Afghanistan as an obstacle for that conception. Meanwhile, Hikmatyar with ISI and CIA protection began immediately to compensate for his lack of popular support by developing an international traffic in opium and heroin. Not on his own, however, with ISI and foreign assistance. After Pakistan banned opium cultivation in February 1979 and Iran followed suit in April, uh, the Pashtun areas of Pakistan and Afghanistan attracted Western drug cartels and scientists, including some fortune seekers from Europe and the United States, to establish heroin and processing facilities in the tribal belt. Heroin labs had opened in the northwest frontier province by 1979, a fact duly noted by the Canadian Maclean's magazine of April 30, 1979. According to Alfred McCoy, by 1980, Pakistan Afghan opium dominated the European market and supplied the 60% of the American illicit demand as well. McCoy also records that Gulbidin Hikmatyar controlled a complex of six heroin laboratories in a region of Baluchistan, where the ISI was in total control. The consequences were swiftly felt in America, where heroin from the Golden Crescent neg ne negligible uh, before 1979 amounted in 1980 to 60% of the U.S. market. And by 1986, for the first time, the region supplied 70% of the higher-grade heroin in the world and supplied a new army of 650,000 addicts in Pakistan itself. Witnesses confirmed that the drugs were, sh were, were shipped out of the area on the new Pakistan army trucks uh, that shipped in covert U.S. military aid. Yet before 1986, the only high-level heroin bust in Pakistan was made at the instances of a single Norwegian prosecutor. Not one was investigated by the 17 narcotics officers in the U.S. Embassy. Eight tons of Afghan-Pakistani morphine base from a single Pakistani source supplied the Sicilian Mafia, a.k.a. the Pizza Connection, in New York, said by the FBI supervisor on the case to have been responsible for 80% of the heroin reaching the United States between 1978 and 1984. Meanwhile, the CIA director William Casey appears to have promoted a plan suggested to him in 1980 by the former French intelligence chief Alexandre de Marenches that the CIA supply drugs on the sly to Soviet troops, although Marenches denied subsequently the plan Operation Mosquito went forward. There are reports that heroin, hashish, and even cocaine from Latin America soon reached Soviet troops and that along with the CIA, ISI-linked Bank of Credit and Commerce International, a few American intelligence operatives were deeply enmeshed in the drug trade before the war was over. Maureen Orth had heard from Mathea Falco, head of the International Narcotics Control for the State Department under Jimmy Carter, that the CIA and ISI together encouraged the Mujahideen to addict Soviet troops. In 2007, Afghanistan supplied 93% of the world's opium according to the U.S. State Department. Illicit poppy production, meanwhile, brings $4 billion into Afghanistan or more than a half or more than half the country's $7.5 billion, according to the UN Office of Drug Control, UNODC. It also represents about a third of the economy of Pakistan and of the ISI in particular. 
parts which have become the key to the drug trade in Central Asia. The UN Drug Control Program estimated in 1999 that the ISI made around $2.5 billion annually from the scale of illegal drugs. In the year 2000, the CIA chooses principal ally, Ahmad Shah Massoud of the Northern Alliance, despite the objection of other national security advisors that Massoud was a drug runner. If the CIA established a permanent base with him in the Panjshir, it risked entanglement with the heroin trade. There was no ambiguity about U.S. intention to use drug traffickers to initiate its position in Afghanistan. The CIA mounted its coalition against the Taliban in 2001 by recruiting and even importing drug traffickers, usually old assets from the 1980s. An example was Haji Rahman, who had retired to Dijon, France, whom the British and American officials met with and persuaded to return to Afghanistan. In Afghanistan in 2001, as in 1980, and as in Laos in 1959, the U.S. intervention has been a bonanza for the international drug syndicates. With the increase of chaos on the countryside and a number of aircraft flying in and out of the country, opium production more than doubled from 3,276 metric tons in the year 2000 and 185 in 2001, the year of a Taliban ban on opium, to 8,200 metric tons in 2007. One can ask themselves, why would the United States ally themselves with local narco-traffickers? Peter Scott Dale summarized it in his book, The American War Machine. Partially, this has been from Real Politique, in recognition of the local power re realities represented by the drug traffics. Partially, it has been from the need to escape domestic political restraints. The traffickers have supplied additional financial resources needed because of U.S. budgetary limitations and they have also provided assets not bound as the U.S. is by the rules of war. These facts have led to enduring intelligence networks involving both oil and drugs or more specifically both petrodollars and narcodollars. These networks, particularly in the Middle East, have become so important that they affect not just the conduct of U.S. foreign policy but the health and behavior of the U.S. government, U.S. banks and corporations, and indeed the whole U.S. society. American banks and companies definitely benefit from this drug trade. And I will once again uh, quote from The American War Machine by Peter Scott Dale. A Senate staff report has estimated that $500 billion to $1 trillion in criminal proceeds are laundered through banks worldwide each year, with about half of that are laundered through United States banks. The London Independent reported in 2004 that drug trafficking constitutes the third biggest global commodity in cash terms after oil and the arms trade. U.S. banks have developed highly elaborate set of policies for transferring illicit funds to the United States, investing those funds in legitimate businesses of U.S. government bonds and legitimating them. The U.S. Congress has held numerous hearings, provided detailed exposés of the illicit practices of the banks, passed several laws, and called for stiffer enforcement by any number of public regulators and private bankers. Yet the biggest banks continue their practices, the sums of dirty money grows exponentially, because both the state and the banks have neither the will nor interest to put an end to the practices and that, that provide high profits and buttress in an otherwise fragile empire. Canadian commentator Assad Ismi have summarized the particulars. 91% of the $197 billion spent on cocaine in the U.S. stays there, and American banks launder $100 billion of drug money every year. Those identified as money laundering conduits include the Bank of Boston, Republic National Bank and Trust CEO of Kennedy, and Riggs National Bank of Washington. Citibank helped Raul Salinas, the brother of former Mexican President Carlos Salinas, 
move millions of dollars out of Mexico into secret Swiss bank accounts under false names. In addition, manufacturers, uh, manufacturers Hanover, Chase Manhattan Bank, Chemical Bank, and Ar uh, Irving Trust have admitted not reporting money transfers to the U.S. government. The Bank Secrecy Act of 1970 requires that all transactions over $10,000 be reported. The Bank of America has been fined $4.745 million for not revealing transfers of more than $12 billion. Antonio Maria Costa, head of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, claimed in a London Observer article that drug money worth billions of dollars kept the financial system afloat at the height of the global crisis. According to the London Observer, Costa said he has seen evidence that the proceeds of organized crime were the only liquid investment capital available to some banks on the brink of collapse last year. He said the majority of the $352 billion of drug profits was absorbed into the financial system was first drawn to his attention by intelligence agencies and prosecutors around 18 months ago. In many instances, the money from drugs was the only liquid investment capital. In the second half of 2008, liquidity was the banking system's main problem. Hence, liquid capital became an important factor. In 2006, the previously cited report to the World Bank argued that at the top level, Around 25 to 30 key traffickers, the majority of them in southern Afghanistan, controlled major transactions and transfers. Working closely with sponsors in top government and political positions, in 2007, the London Daily Mail reported that the four largest players in the heroin business are all senior members of the Afghan government. In December 2009, Harper's published a detailed essay on Colonel Abdul Razik, the master of spin bulldog drug trafficker and Karzai ally whose rise was abetted by a ring of crooked officials in Kabul and Kandahar as well as by overstretched NATO commanders who found his control over a key border town useful in their war against the Taliban. In 2005, the, for example, Drug Enforcement Administration agents found more than 9 tons of opium in the office of Sher Mohammad Akhundzadeh, the governor of Helmand province and a close friend of Karzai who had accompanied him into Afghanistan in 2001 on a motorbike. And Sher Mohammad Akhundzadeh is the man that we see here. Uh, the British successfully demanded that he be removed from office. But the news report confirming that Akhundzadeh had been removed announced also that he had been simultaneously given a seat in the Afghan Senate. Former warlord and provincial governor Gul Agha Sherzai, who is this man, Uh, an American favorite who in 2009 endorsed Karzai's re-election campaign has also been linked to the drug trade. In 2002, trafficker Haji Bashar Nurzai, who is this guy, uh, whereby uh, the Americans agreed to tolerate Nurzai's drug trafficking in exchange for supplying intelligence on the Taliban. By 2004, according to the, to the House of International Relations Committee testimony, Nurzai was smuggling two metric tons to Pakistan every eight weeks. We look into the uh, statistics in the UN ODC's annual reports. Uh, it is reported that the Taliban revenues from opium, which ranges between 90 to $160 million, are less than 5% of the total earned drug income in Afghanistan in 2008, which is $3.4 billion, or 6% of the total in 2009, uh, which makes it $2.8 billion. The estimates for all insurgents, not just the Taliban, are from 200 to $400 million, or less than 12% of the total Afghan drug income in 2008, which was $3.4 billion. While one can debate the details of these estimates, uh, it is obvious that the Taliban and insurgent groups' share of the Afghan dope trade uh, re remains small. It follows that there are many players with a much larger financial stake in the Afghan drug trade than local Afghan drug lords, Al-Qaeda, and the Taliban. Um, 
many people, such as Sibel Edmonds, uh, who Peter Scottdale brought up in his book, The American War Machine, has charged the Pakistani and Turkish intelligence working together, utilize the resources of the international networks, uh, working together uh, to utilize the resources of the international networks transmitting Afghan heroin. In addition, Edmonds claim that the FBI was also gathering evidence against senior Pentagon officials, including household names who were aiding foreign agents. Douglas Risen reports that one of these senior officials argued in a, Washing in a White House meeting that counter-narcotics was not part of the war on terrorism and so, defense, uh, and, and so defense wanted no part of it in Afghanistan. As noted earlier, uh, Loretta Napoleoni uh, has argued <coughs> that there are uh, a Turkish and ISI-backed Islamist route of Al-Qaeda allies across North Central Asia, reaching from Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, through Turkey and Azerbaijan to Kosovo. Kosovo. Dennis Doyle, a former top-level Drug Enforcement Administration agent in the Middle East, corroborated the CIA's historic interest in that region's drug connections. On a anti-drug conference where the author Peter Sc Scott Dale was present, uh, then uh, Mr. Doyle said, in my 30-year uh, history in the Drug Enforcement Administration and related agencies, uh, the major targets of my investigation almost invariably turned out to be working for the CIA. Above all, it has been estimated that 80% or more of the profits from the traffic are reaped in the countries of consumption. We can be confident that some of those profits have been channeled into lobbying for the war machine's effort in Afghanistan. It is because of the larger share of drug profits going to supporters of the Kabul government that U.S. strategies to attack the Afghan drug trade are simply limited to attacking drug traffickers supporting the insurgents. Such strategies have the indirect effect of increasing the opium market share of the past and present CIA assets in the Kabul regime headed by Hamid Karzai, a former CIA asset, including the president's brother, uh, Ahmed Wali Karzai, who is this man right here, uh, who is an active CIA asset, and Abdul Rashid Dustum, uh, who is this man right here. So... Uh, who is also a CIA asset, may I add, if I didn't say that. But anyway, the aim of U.S. anti-drug campaigns abroad has never been to destroy or eradicate the drug trade. Uh, the aim of, of all these campaigns has to been to alter market share, to target specific enemies, and thus ensure that the drug traffic remains under the control of those traffickers who are allies uh, with the state security apparatus and or the CIA. This was notable, notably true as well in, in Laos in the 1960s when the CIA intervened militarily with air support to assist Juan Raticon's army in a battle over a contested opium caravan in Laos. It is true in Afghanistan uh, when the U.S. United States had a military presence there where the U.S. policy was to target only traffickers who supported the insurgents. McCoy goes through the Central Asian transit traffic and Peter Sc Scott Dale has also uh, cited uh, McCoy in his uh, book, The American War Machine. I have also bought the book uh, that McCoy has written, which is... Uh, the Politics of Heroin, CIA Complicity in the Global Drug Trade. And uh, one of the chapters he talked about Afghanistan. And uh, during the 1990s, Afghanistan's soaring opium harvest fueled an international smuggling trade, 
that knitted Central Asia, Russia, and Europe into a vast illicit market of arms, drugs, and money laundering, drugs moving west from Afghanistan to Europe, guns and money flowing east. In this 3,000-mile journey toward Europe by truck, camel, air, and sea, narcotics swept westward with surprising speed across a dozen boundaries, almost immune to interdiction or interference. Yet wherever this invisible commerce touched ground for processing, packaging, or exchange, the illicit enterprise quickly ramified, encouraging drug production, official corruption, mass addiction, and HIV infection. Though the alchemy of capitalism, mafias formed, ethnic separatists were armed, and a culture of criminality crystallized. The northern routes toward Russia touched ground in Kyrgyzstan, where they fostered a lethal mix of intravenous injection and HIV infection, with 30 to 49% of all addicts in Osh infected by October 2000. From Kyrgyzstan's cities, some routes moved northeast to Siberian cities, such as Irkutsk and Vladivostok, or northwest, uh, northwestern route to Russia and Europe. In April 2000, only 18 months after trafficking, first reached into central Russia from Afghanistan, the city of Irkutsk, long free of both drugs and HIV, had registered 8,500 heroin addicts and 5,000 new HIV cases. With officials fearing that actual numbers for both could be 10 times that high. About the same time, in late 1998, these heroin routes reached Russia's far eastern port of Vladivostok, where Chechen, Tajik, and Azeri gangs controlled a traffic that soon engulfed the city in petty crime and fueled an illicit international trade with Japan and Korea in fish, timber, and stolen cars. In the first half of 1999, heroin use across Russia increased 4.5 times over 1998. Within a year, Russia's official number of HIV cases had tripled to 58,000. In releasing the UN's annual review of AIDS in November 2001, its program director, Dr. Peter uh, Payot, highlighted an explosion of HIV from Eastern Europe to Central Asia with 250,000 new infections, largely from injected drugs, raising the total to over a million. Across these vast distances, with poor communication, ad hoc alliances within and among ethnic diasporas provided critical criminal linkages Kosovars scattered from Geneva to Macedonia, Turks from Berlin to Kazakhstan, Azerbaijanis from Sumgat to Kyrgyzstan, and Chechens from Baku to Kazakhstan. In the cities that served as trading posts in this traffic, Osh, Tashkent, Samarkand, Baku, Tbilisi, uh, Skopje, Pristina, and Tirana, extraordinary profits from drugs and guns have produced mafia gangs, criminal diasporas, tribal warlords, and rebel armies. Among these many ethnic syndicates, the Georgians, Azeris, and Chechens control drug distribution in Russia, while the tr Turks dominate the refining of Afghan opium into heroin for sale in Europe. In the grand hotels of Central Asia, the Caucasus, and the Balkans, mafias and narco-nationalists were distinctive were a distinctive presence in the 1990s. Muscular men with designer suits, high-powered weapons, and stolen Mercedes, Mercedes sedans. Cutting across the ethnic syndicates, Osama bin Laden's Al-Qaeda organization, in the view of British Prime Minister Tony Blair and Saudi Crown Prince Abdullah, used its militant Muslim network to traffic in, uh, trafficking drugs from Afghanistan to Bosnia. Already uh, at, uh, attenuated by post-socialist economic miasma and the strains of new nationhood, state control, and civil society weakened before the power of these new narco-mafias with their superior firepower, wealth, and political influence. In the 1990s, Afghan opium sustained both regional and international markets, creating a complex of new illicit connections in 1998, 
the UN estimated that 42% of Afghanistan's harvest fed European markets, but the balance, 58%, sustained addicts within the region. 3 million in Iran, another 2 million in Pakistan, and lesser numbers in Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan. Within Afghanistan, opium smuggling started at two points. Helmand province in the south and uh, Nagarahar province in the east. With easy transport through Khaybar Pass, uh, Nagarahar, source of a quarter of the country's harvest, sent its opium eastward to serve Pakistan's million-plus heroin addicts. From the fertile Helmand Valley, home to half of Afghanistan's opium harvest, Armed convoys joined the daily traffic of 300 trucks moving west from Kandahar toward Iran and north into Central Asia, the main corridor in Afghanistan's $3 billion smuggling trade. Between 1990 and 1997, Iran's opium seizures along its Afghan border surged from 21 to 162 metric tons, forcing Tehran to close the border in 1998. In the violent shootouts that followed, Iran seized over 16 tons of heroin and morphine base, much of the latter destined for heroin laboratories in Turkey. Over the past 20 years, some 2,700 Iranian police have been killed in clashes with drug smugglers, most along the Afghan border. In 2000 alone, 142 Iranian personnel died in 1,532 armed confrontations. In 2023 or 2022, as far as I remember, the official uh, number of dead Iranian army personnel and border patrol people were around 4,000. But this book is talking mainly about the early 2000s and the 90s. But not even this aggressive enforcement could stop smuggling by fierce and rebellious Baluchi tribes who move freely across the desert frontier into southern Iran. According to the UN, Iran's drug seizures of 254 tons in 2000 represented nearly 90% of the world's total. Fueled by this irrepressible flow, Iran's addict population soared beyond the official tally of 1.2 million to an estimated 3.3 million in 2001. Although Iran could not seal this border, its efforts diverted much of the Europe-bound traffic northward to Herat and then into Turkmenistan. After Iran and Pakistan absorbed the bulk of Afghanistan's harvest, the balance of some 40% began a complex westward journey that delivered 90% of Europe's heroin supply. One of the main flows started with a daily traffic of some 200 trucks north from Jalalabad and Kabul toward the country's desolate northeastern corner, adjacent to Tajikistan, where the independent commanders of the Northern Alliance financed their rebel armies with heroin. By 1996, heroin labs were opening along the northern border in Badakhshan, under control of the Northern Alliance and in the provinces of Balkh and Faryab, under the Uzbek warlord General Abdul Rashid Dustum. In the border province of Kunduz, the fundamentalist Hezbi Islami faction under Gulbidin Hekmatyar operated several heroin laboratories until the Taliban captured the area in May 1997, forcing him to shift operations eastward to Badakhshan. From these northern borderlands, the young Muslim warlord Juma Namangani, backed by Osama bin Laden, coordinated a loose trafficking syndicate that spanned Central Asia flying opium from Nagarhar's fields in eastern Afghanistan to labs in the northern city of Kunduz. Operating heroin labs in Tajikistan and using its network of militants across the region as careers. To Chechnya in the Caucasus. At the end of the Tajik civil war in 1997, this Uzbek Muslim militant had gathered rootless fighters into his Islamic Movement for Uzbekistan, IMU, and used them to dominate the drug routes through Tajikistan. By 2000, the IMU controlled an estimated 70% of the narcotics transiting through Tajikistan to Kyrgyzstan. 
After Afghanistan's record harvest of 1999, the IMU used drug money to extend guerrilla operations into Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. A bid that reportedly ended with his death during the U.S. attack in Afghanistan, on Afghanistan in November 2001. Through the plains and passes of northeastern Afghanistan, an array of rebel commanders sent heavily armed caravans across the border into Tajikistan, the first stage in a journey towards Central Asia, Russia and Europe. In a vain attempt to stem this flow, Tajikistan's federal guards fought 96 armed clashes with smugglers in 2000, suffering 12 casualties and seizing 3 tons of opium and heroin. From 1992 to 1997, the Tajik Civil War had expanded the country's role as a transit zone for Afghanistan's heroin, as local warlords smuggled drugs to buy arms and then retain their drug connections after the peace settlement brought, brought them into government. By 1997, the UN estimated that one-third of Tajikistan's gross, gross, gross national product was generated by the transit traffic in drugs. Across the swath of the Eurasian landmass, 500 miles south, north, south to north and 3,000 miles west to east, an, an ever-changing web of smuggling routes traced reoccurring, recurring patterns within three dis distinct sectors between Central Asia and the Balkans. As morphine and heroin shipments left Afghanistan's laboratories, they moved west through Iran northwest across Turkmenistan, or more commonly north across Tajikistan to Osh and Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan. Crossing a maze of indefensible, illogical borders, the legacy of Stalinist strategy for blocking ethnic secession. From the Osh drug market, or lesser trade centers to Dushanbe and Bishkek, drug shipments then turn generally westward by air to Moscow, overland across Turkmenistan, or more uh, circuitously, circuitously through Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. Indicative of the traffic scale, in September 1997, Turkmenistan officials seized 502 kilograms of heroin in a truck carrying rice west from Kandahar, Afghanistan to Baku, Azerbaijan. In November, they intercepted 1.2 tons of heroin on a truck heading west to Gaziantep, Turkey, and then in the first seven months of 1998 confiscated 41 tons of acetic uh, any anhydride heroin's uh, pr precursor chemical from Iranian trucks eastbound for Afghanistan. Once across the Caspian Sea, they, these diffuse westerly routes merged as they entered the Caucasus with its volatile mix of contested boundaries, ethnic insurgency, local mafias and criminal clans. In this rigged ish isthmus uh, between the Caspian and Black Seas, an extraordinary array of armed groups processed morphine, smuggled heroin with near impunity. The Kurdistan Workers' Party PKK, in Azerbaijan, local Azerbaijani mafia clans in Baku, Sumgait and uh, Nakhchivan, Armenian syndicates allied with the nationalist Dachnak Party, the Azeri Grey Wolves, Ossetian and Abkhazian separatists in Georgia, and Chechen nationalists to the north. Whether directly across Iran or less directly through Turkmenistan and the Caucasus, most shipments of heroin and morphine base pass through Turkey were 2.9 tons of Europe-bound heroin were seized in 1999, representing 30% of all seizures worldwide. In 2002, Turkey's gendarmes seized a shipment of 7.5 tons of morphine base from Afghanistan, a record haul in indicative of the enormous scale of Afghanistan's exports and Turkey's heroin industry. In a reprise of its role as a cultural crossroads, Turkey drew precursor chemicals from Europe and morphine from Afghanistan to become the transshipment point for an estimated 80% of the heroin seized in Europe. Moving north from Turkey, 
or around and across the Black Sea from the Caucasus. Drug shipments, now almost entirely heroin, pass through the Balkans where rival ethnic militias, Serb, Croat, Bosnian and Kosovar, used drug profits to purchase arms and pay fighters. As Turkey became the site for refining Afghan opium into heroin for Europe, traffic along the so-called Balkan route soared. During the 1980s, an alliance between a new Italian syndicate, La Sacra Corona Unita, and uh, rising Armenian crime groups made the Adriatic Sea a southern route between Turkey and Europe. Between, after the abolition of Albania's security service and uh, Sigurimi in July 1991, several thousand ex-agents used the Adriatic ports of Vlora and Durres as entrepots on this route for the smuggling of guns, drugs, prostitutes and stolen cars. Steady Armenian migration to Europe intensified between 1992 and 1995, when 350,000 refugees fled Kosovo, creating a criminal diaspora that dominated heroin distribution in Switzerland and Germany. In 1990, Swiss Federal Police launched Operation Benjamin, which uncovered an arms heroin traffic with Kosovo and eight years later reported that Albanians dominated heroin distribution in all cantons. A Kosovo criminal diaspora based in Skopje, uh, Pristina and Tirana smuggled heroin across the Adriatic Sea. In Western Europe, Albanian exiles used drug profits to ship Czech and Swiss arms back to Kosovo for the separatist, separatist guerrillas of the Kosovo Liberation Army, KLA. In 1997 and 1998, but these Kosovo drug syndicates armed the KLA for a revolt against Belgrade's army. After 1995, moreover, the drug uh, traffic expanded along the northern route from Turkey through Yugoslavia to Central Europe, making Belgrade a crime capital and providing a more direct route for Kosovo smugglers like uh, Princ uh, Doboroshi, one of Europe's leading traffickers, he used his heroin profits to purchase arms for the KLA until his capture in March 1999. Within Serbia and its satellite states, the notorious Arkan Zeljoko uh, Raznatovic, one of, the, one of several narco-nationalists backed by Belgrade state security, used drugs, contraband and counterfeiting to finance his Scorpion gang which terrorized Kosovo and murdered rival Kosovo drug dealers in the mid-1990s. Even after the 1999 Kumanovo Agreement settled the Kosovo conflict, the UN administration of the province, preoccupied with mediating ethnic conflict, allowed a thriving heroin traffic along the northern route from Turkey. The former commanders of the KLA, both local clans and aspiring national leaders continue to dominate the transit traffic through the Balkans, battling Serbian police for control of strategic smuggling corridors. The most militant of these local commanders, Mohamed Jamal Jemajali, uh, had reportedly been a major drug dealer in Switzerland before joining the KLA in 19, 1998. In May 2001, Italian peacekeepers in uh, KFOR seized a truckload of heavy weapons, including 52 rocket launchers and five SAM-7 ground-to-air missiles near the Kosovo border, believed destined for Albanian guerrillas inside southern Serbia. According to Croatian police sources, Albanian syndicates had probably uh, bartered heroin for these arms from Croatian criminals, many of them former army officers. The purpose of this video is to give you a broader geopolitical view of the drug trade and specifically the Golden Crescent drug trade. In the, uh, in the future, I might do a video on the Golden Triangle and the drug wars in Latin America, specifically perhaps in Mexico, which is the most violent one and that is ongoing. And uh, basically... I want to show you guys the consequences and the ripple effects 
of the uh, of the drug trade uh, and the players that are involved everybody from the Taliban to the CIA to the Northern Alliance to different crime syndicates and ethnic insurgents uh, groups uh, from in the Caucasus and the Balkans etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, because this is bigger than just your local drug dealer or gang in your city uh, so keep that in mind and if you're struggling with an addiction um, I hope you get well and I urge you guys to to seek help um, so you can you can get healthy basically I want to thank everybody for watching please hit the like button subscribe hit the notification bell so you won't miss any videos if you want me to do longer content like this uh, please uh, Write, write, write that in the comment section and uh, we will do more content like this in the future. Thank you very much. Stay blessed.